Been spending most our lives living in a gangsta's paradise. Been spending most our lives living in a gangsta's paradise. Keep spending most our lives living in a gangsta's paradise. Keep spending most our lives living in a gangsta's paradise. Three, two, one. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, welcome friends to the 39th episode of Crime and Punishment, a legal podcast, not a political one by any stretch of the imagination. This is the podcast of the Invictus Law Firm, PA, a criminal defense law firm in Orlando, Florida, the website for which is AugustusInvictus.com. We have absolutely no political opinions on this program. We are talking about the Soviet Union and the United States today only in legal terms. We have no political state in the matter. The cases we are about to talk about today, we are only providing legal analysis. Any political inferences you might draw from our legal analysis, should I say mine, Tiger is not here today, any political inferences you might draw from today's legal analysis are your own. We here at Crime and Punishment love Big Brother. We would never speak out against him. We would never speak out against the policies of Big Brother. We have no stake in the matter. This is a news program where we talk about the law. That is all. Today, we are going to talk about a federal case. We've got a lot to talk about. But that's what I want to start off with, and we'll see how far we get in this hour that we have together. We've also got to talk about the Russians, not the Soviets, but the modern Russians, the invasion of Ukraine, its legality under international law. If we have time after talking about this federal case, then that's what we are going to address. Now, I was trying to be slick before we went on air, I was trying to, you know, send out um, the newsletter while that intro was playing. Unfortunately, that intro is just not long enough. So now we've added the link. Now we're previewing it, show online preview, and now it's being sent out to the, why is this not working? Schedule issue. There we go. Really need someone to do this for me. I'm terrible at this stuff. Read my latest. We are the Soviets. All right. So here's the link. I'm going to get you guys the link to the newsletter. If you guys are not, yes, send now. If you are not subscribed to the newsletter, subscribe to the newsletter. I'm also going to post the viral style thing. Cheers. All right. So the chat's working. There's the newsletter. We've got to buy a new laptop, a video camera. I've got to go. I got to go live on video. I'm quite honestly not looking forward to that. <clears throat> you might have noticed I've not appeared on video in over two years now. Since my arrest, I've not appeared on video. But we got to buy a video camera, new laptop, boost the internet for the sound quality of this program, so on and so forth. So there's a viral style. Feed us that delicious t-shirt money so we can buy all this stuff. 
Let's get out of here and go into the main topic of today. I want to introduce this federal case by talking about the story of Pavlik Morozov. And, you know, I should just read the newsletter that you guys are about to subscribe to. I was going to read somebody else's article, but mine is more to the point. Once upon a time, a 14-year-old boy named Pavlik Morozov discovered that his father was up to no good, planning and organizing against the rightful government. A true and faithful patriot, young Pavlik informed the authorities of his father's anti-government activities. Pavlik was a good boy, a true patriot, and was rightly ashamed of his father's unacceptable behavior. Shortly after this patriotic act, his dastardly relative snuck up on Pavlik whilst the young hero was picking berries in the woods. These evil anti-government villains stabbed Pavlik to death, making him a martyr. He was then named by the authorities a pioneer hero and celebrated for generations in the Soviet Union. In today's episode of Crime and Punishment, we discuss Pavlik's legacy in the United States. The first trial of the infamous January 6 cases concluded earlier this week, and the defendant, Guy Reffitt, was found guilty by a jury of his peers. His heroic son, Jackson Reffitt, had discovered that his father was up to no good, planning and organizing against the rightful government. A true and faithful patriot, young Jackson informed the FBI of his father's anti-government activities. Jackson was a good boy, a true patriot who always wore his mask and socially distanced, and was rightly ashamed of his father's unacceptable behavior. Hence the title of today's episode, We Are the Soviets Now. There was an article about this published by the Gateway Pundit of all the outlets, right? And it has a photograph of the Refit family. It's got Guy in his polo shirt and his sunglasses, a dad, just this is an American dad. The old, <laughs> This is just like the emblem of the American dad in this picture. It's got his blonde wife right next to him. Then it's got their son, who's wearing a mask in the picture, and a pink backpack. He's got long hair. Next to him is a pretty cute brunette sister, and next to her is a pretty cute blonde sister. No one in this photograph is wearing a mask or wearing a pink backpack except Jackson Reffitt, the young patriot who turned his father in to the FBI. That's just, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. I want to read first. I'm not going to read the Gateway Pundit. I, God bless him. But if we're going to read some slanted news, we're going to read NPR. In the first January 6th trial, a jury found Capitol Riot defendant Guy Riffitt guilty. A little more than a year after a group of pro-Trump rioters overwhelmed police, stormed the U.S. Capitol, and temporarily halted the country's peaceful transfer of power, a jury has unanimously returned a verdict and the first trial stemming from the events on January 6, 2021. Guilty on all counts. I want to stop. That's just the first paragraph, and it's dramatic. It's that, that guilty on all counts, that's its own paragraph. They want you, that, that's like a very dramatic pause, really emphasizing that. It's good dramatic writing. This is supposed to be the news by the way, but don't let that get in the way. I want to stop there just to point out not just the fact that at this point there is no debate anymore as to what happened. They were rioters. They overwhelmed the police. They stormed the U.S. Capitol. That's beyond debate. Here's the interesting part that goes back to young Pavlik Morozov. These people temporarily halted the country's peaceful transfer of power. That is the myth that we have in America. Every four years, there is a bloodless revolution. Because every four years, we vote for 
the monarch, effectively, of the United States. Once, a, one of the, once the president is voted out, the new president comes in. It is a revolution, a transfer of power that is peaceful. There is no bloodshed, no shots fired. Not this time. God forbid NPR point that out. Don't point out the fact that Ashley Babbitt was shot. And even if you did point that out, it was the rioters' fault anyway, wasn't it? So a mostly peaceful transfer of power. And I, I say it's interesting not because that's the mythos, not because of the obvious reverberations of the Black Lives Matter mostly peaceful protests, but because it harkens back to the Soviet Union itself. When you grew up in the Cold War and you heard about all the differences between the United States and the Soviet Union, if you grew up with your father as a lawyer during the Cold War, as I did, you also heard all about the legal differences between the legal system of the Soviet Union and our Anglo-American common law. You always heard about the KGB. <clears throat> These people have no rights. You heard about neighbors spying on each other. You heard about, you know, fathers turning in sons and vice versa. You don't hear about that in Russia, though, right? Like, in Russia, they don't go around bragging about, you have no rights. This is a dystopian hell. It, that's not their propaganda. The propaganda in the Soviet Union is this is utopia, or at least we're making it utopia. <clears throat> we are advanced. The rest of the world is behind us. They are all counter-revolutionaries. We are ushering in the future, not just of Russia, but of all of humankind. We are ushering in the future, and all these people are in the past. Which is exactly what all the democratic powers, all the republican governments were saying uh, throughout Europe, right? When they were toppling monarchies, saying monarchy is a barbaric system of the past. And we, you know, waving the tricolor, toppling all these monarchies, we are the future. Soviet Union is saying the same thing. We have rights, of course. We have human rights. We are the only ones, really, who believe in human rights. If fathers turn in, excuse me, if sons turn in their fathers, it's because they believe in the freedoms we have in the Soviet Union. They believe in the future. And this guy, the father of Pavlik Morozov, he's a counter-revolutionary. He is an anti-government type. He is trying to take us back to that barbaric past. If, you, I, if you're listening to this, you can already tell the parallels, right? This guy, Guy Refid, he's a Trumpster. He's carrying around a rifle. He's hearkening back to the golden days of white supremacy. He doesn't believe in this future that we're building here in the United States. He doesn't believe in racial equality. He doesn't believe in the peaceful transfer of power. This man is a monster. And his son is a hero for turning this man in. Jackson, not Morozov, Jackson Revit. Jackson Revit is a hero. He always wears his mask. He socially distances. He's a responsible young man. He knows that his father is mixed up in evil deeds. Evil, white supremacist revolutionaries at the Capitol stormed the heart of democracy. The very heart of democracy. They stormed it. And they threatened the lives of our legislators. Thank God. Jackson Reffitt was there on the side of civility, of order, of progress. This is precisely the messaging of the Soviet Union, if you lived over there in the Soviet Union. 
The defendant, let's go back to the article itself. The defendant, 49-year-old Guy Wesley Reffitt of Texas, was found guilty of these five criminal charges. <clears throat> Transporting a firearm and furtherance of a civil disorder. Obstruction of an official proceeding, that being the peaceful transfer of power, right? The certification of the votes for Biden. Entering or remaining in a restricted area or grounds with a firearm. Obstructing officers during a civil disorder. And obstruction of justice. Three of those charges are obstruction. By the way. Obstruction of justice, hindering communication through force or threat of physical force. It took two days to seat a jury made up of Washington, D.C. residents. I love this paragraph. Many potential jurors said they lived or worked near the Capitol building, the scene of multiple crimes in this case, or even knew Capitol police officers who were injured that day, which complicated jury selection. What they mean by that is during voir dire, which is what we call the jury selection process, you are asked as a juror about things that would indicate that you are prejudiced in the matter, that you came there with some preconceived view and you think this guy is already, you already think this guy's innocent or this guy's guilty, right? One of those things that we routinely ask is, do you have any friends or family that are in law enforcement? That is a general question. You have to answer it. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get kicked off the jury. So if I ask juror number 12, you know, do you have any friends or family in law enforcement? Because her juror sheet is going to tell me that already. So I'm going to specifically ask her, do you have any friends or family in law enforcement? And she says, yes. I'm going to say, where's that? She's going to say, oh, uh, you know, the Colorado State Police. That's not necessarily relevant. Right to me in, here in Florida. And if I'm in a trial in Orlando, Florida, and juror number 12 has some cousin who works for the Colorado State Police, that doesn't necessarily disqualify her. So I'd ask some follow-up questions, the most important of which is, you know, if a cop gets on this stand, does your relationship with your cousin who happens to work for the Colorado State Police mean that you are going to give greater credibility to the testimony coming out of an officer than you would a regular witness who's not a cop, who's not in uniform. I would <clears throat> probably ask it less professionally and more, you know, in layman's terms, but that's basically what I'm asking. Is she going to believe this cop testifying in my case over a witness for my guy? just because he's a cop or just because he comes in in a uniform. And most people will say no, right? They'll say, no, I mean, I know the guy, but I know cops lie, like they're human, okay? So then you don't get kicked off the jury. If she says, however, yes, uh, my cousin's a cop. He knows all those cops. I know my cousin's a good guy. I know cops don't lie. And I know about all these defendants who lie on the stand and all their witnesses come in and lie. And I know cops don't lie on the stand. Oh, they're getting disqualified because they cannot be neutral. They can't listen to the evidence in a neutral fashion. They're not going to judge based on the evidence. They're going to judge based on the cop said he did it. I believe cops over anybody. That guy, if he's sitting at the table with you, criminal defense lawyer, he's guilty. That will get you disqualified from a jury. So back to the article, point being, what they're saying is what complicated jury selection here is that most, oh, not most, Possibly a lot of, I don't, it doesn't really specify, but there are people in the jury pool who not only work near the Capitol building or live near the Capitol building, but they actually know personally the Capitol police officers who were injured that day. Now, I would strike those people for cause. I'd say there's no possible way they could be... Um, they could be neutral, fair, and impartial in a case like that. But, you know, if I'm the the government attorney, I'm going to say, well, they didn't say they couldn't be fair and impartial. They said they could be neutral. And that's what people do. Yeah, I know the, the Capitol Police officer who said that it was a medieval battle 
and it was like being back in Iraq, right? I know the guy, but yeah, I could be fair and impartial. That's not going to sway my vote on the jury. People say like that, things like that all the time. Total garbage, demonstrably false, absolutely a lie. But if they say, yeah, I could be fair and impartial, then that's what the judge goes with, unfortunately. There's no common sense allowed, really. So at that point, you would use what's called a peremptory strike, not a for-cause strike. Peremptory strikes where you basically don't have to give a reason. Now, if you are peremptory striking every black male, then the government is going to say, uh, excuse me, but they are using all their peremptory strikes on black males. This is clearly a, well, they wouldn't say it's clearly a racist strategy, but they would strongly imply that it was, it had a racial component to it and it's unconstitutional. Anyway, that's what they mean. Long story short, when they're talking about the complications and choosing a jury in this case, because they not only lived or worked near the Capitol building where all this happened, but some of them even knew the Capitol police officers who were injured that day. Judge Dabney Friedrich sought jurors who could keep an open mind despite anything they had heard before. How easy is that under normal circumstances? You have a city like Charlottesville where this is blown up into national news. Everybody in Charlottesville knows about the case. How Are they going to keep an open mind? Like, yeah, the judge is going to instruct them about that, but that's just not going to happen. That's why you file for a change of venue. You say, look, my client cannot get a fair trial here, and the judge will probably deny your change of venue motion. Those are very rarely granted in my experience and my knowledge. But you file it. And who knows? Maybe it'll work. At the very least, it will preserve your client's rights on appeal. In this case, I don't know if that ever happened. But <laughs> something tells me the judge wouldn't have granted it anyway. Not that I know Judge Friedrich, but it's just that's how it goes. They rarely grant these things. But is it realistic to tell a jury in D.C. to keep an open mind? about the white supremacist insurrection that happened January 6, 2021. For normal people, that's not realistic, I would argue. But check out the last sentence of this paragraph. The jury ultimately included employees of NASA and the Department of Defense, as well as a public school maintenance supervisor. I don't know about the public school maintenance supervisor, but I'd say... I bet my boots that if you're an employee of NASA or the Department of Defense, your employers are not going to take kindly to you letting a white supremacist revolutionary off the hook, are they? What employee of NASA is going to want to be in the news and have to answer to his boss as to why Guy Reffitt walked? The jury system, it just, it has to be reformed or scrapped. As Tiger and I always say, it would be better to go back to trial by combat. At least then you have a legitimate fighting chance. No pun intended. <laughs> After opening statements, <clears throat> four days of often emotional testimony and closing arguments in a courthouse located a short walk away from the Capitol, that jury took under four hours to reach its verdict. That's pretty fast for those not in the know. Many of the 700-plus defendants, largest prosecution in United States history, by the way. I've made that point repeatedly. I'm going to keep making that point. I should show you. I don't... Again... If someone wants to volunteer to be the IT guy on air, please do volunteer because I just don't have the capabilities. Um, I went to D.C. after the revolution, excuse me, after, after the peaceful transfer of power that these evil white supremacists tried to stop. I went to D.C. with my daughter. I'm a member of the bar of the United States Supreme Court. I tried to take her. 
they don't let you in. Unless you have an active case and you are arguing before the Supreme Court that day, you're not allowed in, even as a member of the bar. So I could not show my daughter. The entire city was shut down. And I... This is not political commentary. This is just historical observation. It was the same exact thing that I saw, minus the burned out buildings and the black on the side of the <clears throat> the buildings from soot. Uh, it was the exact same thing I saw when I went to Cairo post-revolution. Um, except worse. The streets were completely empty. The White House had been completely taken. I mean, they've been pushing back the border on the White House for years. You used to be able to just walk on the lawn, right? They've put up the fence, and then they started pushing it back um, to where you can't really uh, go near the fence either. They started putting up barricades uh, during COVID, during the Trump thing. You know, he was having special operations come in. That, that barrier... Uh, between the public and the White House kept getting pushed further and further back. When I went to D.C. after all this, uh, you cannot get anywhere near the White House. I don't know about in the past several months. I haven't been there recently. But at that time, post-January 6th, it was a ghost town. You could not go anywhere near there. As I said, I could not take my daughter into the Supreme Court. Uh, I could not go anywhere near the Capitol building. There is a fence all the way around the entire and that's huge that complex is massive it's a big fence uh the public is no longer welcome in those buildings at least again that was post peaceful transfer of power not in the past couple months i haven't been there in the past couple months point being 700 plus defendants as the article points out most massive prosecution in united states history they have completely roped off barricaded uh the three major centers of governmental power in dc after a peaceful transfer of power and it was the same thing i saw in cairo after their revolution it is widely believed continues npr that this uh, guilty verdict will give prosecutors additional leverage in plea negotiations with other defendants. Yes. I'd say that's 100% certainty. Um, everybody who's been saying, I want to go to trial, I want to go to trial, <clears throat> I mean, they might be crazy. Feds don't take things to trial that they don't think they're going to win. It's completely different from state court. But everybody wants to be first because they know all the lawyers know anyway, and hopefully they advise their clients of this. Whoever goes first is going to set the tone for all of the subsequent trials. Now that there's blood in the water, now that this first guy lost, and they have this young Pavlik Morozov as their hero, this patriotic, mask-wearing young man who turned in his own father to the FBI. Thank God for him. Now that they have this iconic case, who's going to trial next? Who thinks that their case is better than his? Who thinks that they stand a better chance with a D.C. jury made up of federal government employees? Disheartening, to say the least. I, for the record, do not have any of these cases. When the verdict was read aloud, Refit showed little emotion. It's interesting. We talked about that last week, I think. Uh, you know, oh, that was it. The, uh, the one where the black man was chosen as foreman in the Chauvin federal prosecution, right? And he was identifying with the victim, which is the complete reversal of what the jury system was supposed to be. Um, they, too, were talking about that about how uh, these guys... No, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't Chauvin. It was the Arbery case. That's right. The black guy who was chosen as the foreman for the Arbery case 
the federal charges against the three guys who were convicted in state court, right? So they did the same thing. Uh, the black guy, uh, Mr. Ransom, that was his name. He was talking about how these guys showed no emotion throughout the trial, no emotion when the verdict was read aloud. They're monsters. It's, that's just insane. And it shows an astounding ignorance of the legal system, which, again, as I said in that episode, is our fault. We as lawyers and judges, all the people in government, it's our fault. We used to have civics classes. We used to teach people, this is what a jury is. This is why we have juries. This is how uh, things go in a courtroom. We routinely tell our clients, do not show emotion when the verdict is read. It's Especially if it's a guilty verdict. If you've had a tough go of it, you've been on trial for a year, two years, three years, you finally get there, jury says not guilty on all charges, maybe you can't control yourself. Maybe you do hug your lawyer and cry and, you know, pump your fist in the air because you're so happy. Okay, fine. You know, get carried away. Not the end of the world. <clears throat> but if the jury comes back and says guilty, you absolutely do not show emotion. Don't do it. And it's not because of the jury. It's not because of the media. It's not because it's the quote unquote right thing to do. It's because of the judge. Because the mythos in American culture is that jury is inviolate. Absolutely sanctified. They are the holy, august body that judges the facts of this case. There was that old South Park episode where they talked about everybody peeing in the Kool-Aid, right? And uh, Tiger Woods was peeing in the Kool-Aid, right? It's like, come on, man. We all know. Come on. The guy's rich. He's famous. He's banging women on the side. Like, what is this uh, what is this witch hunt we're doing, right? Wouldn't you do that if you were in Tiger Woods' position and they shot the guy, he was, he was peeing in the Kool-Aid? That's what this is with the jury, right? If you point out, it's, these people aren't, they're not noble angels. They're, you know, 6 to 12, you know, possibly of average intellect people that we pulled off the street. Maybe, maybe didn't lie in voir dire. Maybe identify with the victim, maybe identify with the defendant. Who knows? But they're going to make bad calls. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows that juries uh, convict innocent people and they let guilty people go. Everybody knows it. But you, God forbid, you can't say that in a court of law. You're insane. If a jury comes back and says guilty and a client flips out and says, you people are fools, how could you possibly have come to this or shows displeasure in any sense or whatever it is, denies that this holy dictum by the jury is God's own word, then you have peed in the Kool-Aid. If the judge sees that, God help you in sentencing. Because I guarantee you the judge is going to make a note of that when he sentences you. Not only did you show no remorse the entire time, but you peed in the Kool-Aid. You disrespected the jury system on which we have based this entire system of law. Now I'm going to throw the book at you. That is why... We tell our clients, no matter what happens when this verdict comes back, you don't show emotion. And now we see the New York Times, we see NPR commenting on this, that these defendants who get guilty verdicts show little emotion. Of course they do. They were told not to. But now it's supposed to be, what, some, some slight on their character, some black mark upon them? That they showed little emotion when a guilty verdict was read? What do you want them to do? Cry? 
throw their hands up, pick up a book and throw it at the foreman? What do you want them to do? Of course they showed little emotion. But that's the media, right? They present it to you as, this is something wrong. Who gets a guilty verdict back and shows little emotion? Something suspicious is going on here. They don't tell you, that's an indication that he was guilty all along. But obviously that's what's implied. By the New York Times, by NPR, and I fear this is going to be a trend across the media soon. Until they egg someone into making a scene when a jury comes back with a guilty verdict that should have been not guilty. At one point during the proceedings, Refit turned to his wife, Nicole Refit, who was sitting in the courtroom. They locked eyes, put their hands on their chests, and nodded at one another. That's actually very touching. Nicole Reffitt spoke to reporters outside the court ro- courthouse soon after. <clears throat> she encouraged other January 6th defendants, whom she referred to as one sixers, not to plead guilty. Guy was used as an example to make all the one sixers take a plea, she said. Do not take a plea, one sixers. Do not. She said that her husband would appeal the ruling and that this fight has just begun. Good. Good man. What a husband and wife team right there. And I say that not politically, but legally. Because what in God's name is going on in the Anglo-American tradition in this country, in our courts of law, where we accept evidence by a son turning in his own father to the FBI? If we say this is acceptable, it's over. It's, you know what? And that reminds me of a, an email I got from Hillsdale. God bless these conservatives. They just don't understand. Last September, it said something like, Dear Augustus, I, I cut off the beginning, I don't know. Last September, something happened at our Constitution Day celebration in Washington, D.C. That's stuck with me for months. Right off the bat, my thought is, Who still celebrates Constitution Day? I I don't know of any... I've been talking about this for weeks with people around me. Like, hey, do you ever hear anybody talk about freedom of speech? Like, does that ever come up in conversations with you? You ever hear anybody talk about the Constitution anymore? Like, we... Everybody's given up on that, right? Like, we don't talk about that anymore. I I have not heard it anywhere. Anywhere, except this, uh, this Hillsdale email... Which is funny because I've I've been asking people this for weeks and suddenly this comes in. They were celebrating Constitution Day last September. He says, during one of the panel discussions about the crisis of the two constitutions, one of the guests asked a fascinating question. The guest mentioned that long after the Roman Republic became the empire, they still inscribed SPQR on nearly everything official from coins to buildings. Yeah, that's something most Americans just, it doesn't register, I guess. Maybe it's a British thing that we carried over, I don't know. But we say that the empire started when Julius Caesar was declared dictator for life, and then, of course, Augustus comes in, and now we have converted from the republic that was killed by Julius Caesar, now we are the empire, beginning with Augustus, right? then why did they still use SPQR on everything for hundreds of years? They still called themselves a republic. Augustus never took that any, any title. He didn't call himself king. He was just the first citizen, right? It was always a republic. Somebody at a Hillsdale event caught on. I Just super late in the game. Um, you had to look up what SPQR means if you're like me. I'll save you the trouble. The Senate and people of Rome. It referred to the government of the ancient Roman Republic. This guest thought that from the perspective of many Romans, the Republic never ended, even though emperors had amassed extraordinary power. So he asked the key question, did our American Republic die years ago 
And are we, as the people of Imperial Rome, oblivious to these changes? I have to confess, I don't think that's the case, but the question has lingered with me since the conference. I have hope in the American people, but some of the events of the last few years have given me pause. And then it goes on into a, a fundraising pitch. Anyway, obviously, I mean, is I don't know. Maybe I'm too close to the situation. It seems super obvious to me. The Republic died. It's over. We don't talk about the Constitution. I mean, yeah, it's there as a legal document. You can haggle about it all day in an appellate court. You can talk about it at trial court. Good luck with that. They'll convict your guy anyway until you take it up with the appellate court. Good luck. Good luck getting a cert review by the Supreme Court on a constitutional issue. Unless it's a hot ticket item of the day on CNN, they're not taking it. So it seems that conservatives are finally catching on that the republic is over. It's over. This is an empire. We call ourselves a republic. It ceased to be a republic a long time ago, and they've only taken the mask off since Charlottesville. We could talk about Russia now. I'd like to finish this article, but that's an interesting thing that I'll just talk about. Let's just talk about it as a tangent. <clears throat> as you all know, if you're listening to this program, after Charlottesville, everybody involved with Charlottesville was blacklisted. Even in the run-up to Charlottesville, if, if Airbnb thought that you were going there um, for the Unite the Right rally, your Airbnb reservation was canceled and your account was terminated. If Uber thought that you were getting a ride to go to Unite the Right for the right wing you, there were there were literally people kicked out of their Ubers on the street. After that, the entire financial system ch started shutting down PayPal's. You were no longer on uh, allowed on GoFundMe. You were not allowed to uh, use super chats on YouTube. Some people got around that. Um, you were not allowed to use Stripe. That was one of the biggest wrenches they threw in everything. You, because these are the companies that all the banks use. Merchant services was one of the biggest problems, right? You're not allowed to use merchant services, which means you can't take credit cards, you can't take donations, and that's what uh, you know. PayPal, Patreon, all these places are on these things. So you are necessarily blacklisted from all fundraising. They perfected that over a couple years, hitting white nationalists, proud boys, anybody accused of being white nationalist or a Nazi, you were blacklisted. And they perfected this system. And nobody said a word about it. They're like, well, it's Nazis. <laughs> they shouldn't have been at Charlottesville. You know, it's Nazis. They have a hateful ideology. And then January 6th happens, right? And then it's turned on the quote-unquote patriots. Well, they're Nazis too now. So you are not allowed to have an account at Chase Manhattan. You're not allowed to use PayPal. You're not allowed to use Patreon. They kick them off of everything. And they say, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not Nazis. How could you do this? This is wrong. Well, they let it happen to all of us, right? All of us accused of white nationalism and white supremacy after Charlottesville. They were fine with that because they weren't racists. They weren't anti-Semites. They were the good guys. They hate white supremacists as much as anybody. But they used it on them, further perfected the system, and now everybody is shocked that, oh my God, all of these same companies displeased with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, are now doing the exact same thing to Russia. Um, under international law, I would argue that these sanctions that we have placed on Russia 
and especially in combination with the explicit support, not just moral support, but support in terms of weaponry and money and everything else they need, our explicit support of Ukraine, very broad, in the daylight, public, military support, it's a clear violation of any neutrality. I mean, the United States has absolutely taken a side in the war. It's beyond dispute. I, nobody could say with a straight face that we haven't. This is what happened in World War II. Roosevelt wanted in the World War. We couldn't get in the World War. Americans did not support it. They didn't care about Germany. That's Europe's problem, not ours. So, what did we do? We put an embargo on Japan. We put an embargo, a steel embargo. We didn't allow anybody to ship steel to them or oil. We didn't do that to China. We only did it to one side. We supported one side that was in a war and not the other. We sanctioned one side and not the other. And we coerced Japan into bombing Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt knew about Pearl Harbor. They did nothing to stop it because that was our justification for getting into the war. It's amazing nobody has talked about that, I suppose because World War II is like the jury system absolutely inviolate. Obviously, the Nazis are the bad guys. We would never do any Machiavellian scheme to get the United States dragged into a world war so that we could help destroy Britain's empire and give half of Europe to communists. That could never have been the end game. Nobody's brought up the obvious parallel of putting an embargo and sanctioning Japan in World War II, drawing them into attacking us, and doing the exact same thing to Russia right now. You're not a neutral country when you place an embargo on a country at war and you don't place the same embargo on the people they're fighting. You have taken a side. You're not neutral. You are now a partisan. The United States, under international law, is a partisan in this war. Might not be a shooting war yet, but we have absolutely no claim to neutrality, right? If Russia attacked us, they would have just cause under international law, I would argue. Legally, not politically. Point being, all of these sanctions, we've got them on Russian oligarchs, right? Imagine what they would say in Russia if they were putting sanctions on Bill Gates, Nancy Pelosi, uh... I don't know who else is big these days. Ted Turner. Is he still alive? I don't know. I've been out of the news for a while. If Russia was putting sanctions on individual American oligarchs all around the world, right? Convincing Iran and China and all these regional powers to seize the yachts of Elon Musk and whoever else thereafter. Uh, would we not consider that an act of war? Of course it is. Absolutely. Famously, in uh, the wars with Britain, the British would impress our, sol our uh, sailors. They would uh, board the ships, they would take the sailors, and they'd say, you're now in Her Majesty's Navy. Thank you for your service. Right? Take merchant ships. If you seize a merchant ship in a time of war, that's an act of war, especially if it's a neutral country. Like, that's, that's International Law 101. You can't do that. If we are a quote-unquote neutral country and we're seizing Russian assets, we're seizing their individuals' assets, calling them oligarchs as though they were responsible for, for the Russia's in, invasion of the Ukraine, how is that any different than if we had invaded Iraq and Iran, China, and Russia had gotten together and started seizing American assets? and going after American oligarchs. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's just 
plain as day, right? If you reverse the roles, would we put up with this? Would we not consider this an act of aggression? Would we not consider this an act of war? What we have done to Russia in the past three weeks? Of course we would. No bloody question. It's obviously an act of war. I'm only speaking legally, not politically. I have no stake politically. I'm not a policymaker. I'm just a legal analyst. So let's go back to the article. It's already 51 minutes in. I haven't even looked at the comments. Is anybody even watching this program? I don't know if I've been uh, talking this whole time. To the article. It's already 51 minutes in. All right, come on. Computer's giving me problems today. That's not loading. Anyway, so she's saying that this fight has just begun. Prosecutors accused Refit of traveling to Washington, D.C. with a fellow member of a far-right militia organization called the Texas Three Percenters. Oh, we do have a... Well, we have a whole bunch of comments by Mr. Boston. I don't know who that is, but for whatever reason, all of his messages have been deleted. Probably something stupid. All right, loud and clear transmission. I'm glad you all can hear me because I didn't even check today. It's possible Klaus Schwab and China are using the Biden administration to screw the U.S. and Europe in favor of China, explains La. I don't know. I can't comment on that. But I will say all these people who are up in arms about China trying to undermine the U.S. administration, China trying to expand their power and undermine U.S. power, how could you possibly be up in arms about that? Of course they're going to do that. Don't we? That's real politic 101, baby. If you are a country, you are expanding. You are gaining power. You undercut the other people who have power. Like, what kind of world do you live in where you think that, how dare China try to take down the United States? That's their job, man. Otherwise, they might as well just make themselves a vassal state of the U.S., Of course they're going to try to undercut us in Africa. They're going to try to expand in Asia. Uh, They're going to try to subvert our society. Not that they have to. We're doing a great job of it ourselves. But of course they're going to do that. Of course they're going to send people into, um, you know, the academic institutions and American companies as spies. Uh, People are so outraged when, like, oh, well, this Chinese student... Uh, at Stanford was uh, an infiltrator for the Chinese government. Of course he was. What kind of idiots are you? You don't think that we do that? You don't think that the Chinese have a legitimate prerogative to spy on the United States and our scientific developments? Of course they do. We're the idiots for not preventing it. You can't blame China for doing what governments do, man. It's uh, it's unbelievable. The, The naivete that people have about China and Russia and the United States government. Oh, that reminds me of another email I received that I wanted to read on air. The inter, this is from Jeremy Scahill who wrote the dirty war and intercept. You've heard me talk about him a lot on this program. I like the intercept except when I don't. (laughs) Um, Let's see. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a bald faced act of aggression. I'm sorry. The, subject of this is the intercept won't make excuses for russia's crimes or those of the united states russia's invasion of ukraine is a bald-faced act of aggression replete with war crimes it is rightly being condemned as such by large numbers of people and nations across the globe from the beginning of this crisis russian president vladimir putin has exploited the past bombing campaigns of the u.s and nato to frame his own warped justification for his murderous campaign in ukraine I will give Mr. Scahill this. At least he's consistent. (laughs) All these people talking about how dare Russia invade the Ukraine. What what are you talking about? Not our business, first of all. But are you really going to sit there on a moral high horse talking about Russia invaded 
the Ukraine poking them in the eye, by the way. Uh, like, we didn't invade Iraq or Afghanistan. Like, we haven't been toppling governments in Latin America, Asia, Africa <laughs> for generations. Get out of town, man. Get out of town. So Putin says, well, look at what the U.S. and NATO have been doing for decades. And they're all up in arms about me invading the Ukraine. Yeah, Scahill's right. He is rightly pointing to all the dirty things that we have done. I saw a, uh, I saw a meme a few days ago. I think my son sent it to me um, about Croatia. Bosnia-Herzegovina has no beach, right? They're, like basically landlocked since the Yugoslav Wars. Yeah, because the Croatians were with us, right? They chose the right side. You know, they were our guys, so we literally just gave them the entire coastline. <laughs> oh, man. Thank God for NATO in the U.S., right? We would never, ever do anything. Uh, well, I guess it's not illegal if you win. We would certainly never do anything unjust or immoral. But that's the thing with international law. So much of it comes down to who wins. At least the intercept, Jeremy Scahill, he is consistent. And he points that out, too. That this also, it almost always comes down to Victor's justice. He says, but the fact that Putin is trying to justify the unjustifiable does not mean that we must ignore the U.S. actions that fuel his narrative. The laws of war and international law should apply not only to the declared bad guys of the moment, or to parties that unilaterally attack other nations, but also to every nation, including our own. <clears throat> that should be a warning to everybody. Ted Kaczynski made this point about the right wing and left wing. He says that the right wing pretends that they're the only ones that can have morality. Oh, we're family values, we're tradition, we're conservative, blah, blah, blah. And they don't realize that the left has taken that morality and just dominated it and rightly pointed out, actually, you guys in the right wing, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Because if you really believed in equality, you would be doing X, Y, and Z like we're trying to accomplish. Kaczynski saw that very, very clearly. The left, they are the moralists. The right wing, they like to pretend they are, but the, the left wing, their entire worldview comes down to this moral notion, equality. Point being, you take something like the Nuremberg trials, <clears throat> you then create a security council, you create NATO, you create this entire liberal international order, and you start exporting Nuremberg, the international, uh, the, excuse me, the military tribunals. Um, you, you do it in Japan, and then you do it for years and years afterward. You charge people with war crimes. You create the International Criminal Court. The Yugoslav Wars happened all over again. We put all those guys on trial. <clears throat> How long until that comes back? on the very people who have been using it. What Scahill is saying here at The Intercept, like I said, should be a warning to everybody. It's only a matter of time before our own country is put in the dock for war crimes. There's no way that we keep power forever. Right now, and since you know, 1948, it's been all fun and games because we've been the superpower and we have this, you know, love-hate relationship with the Soviet Union until it falls, and then we become the ultimate hegemonic superpower. And so if we impose our liberal international order that we created, and we say, all of you who lose all these wars because we've been winning them all, all of you, we're going to put you on trial when we win. Yeah, it's all fun and games, because who's going to stop us? Right, But once the U.S. is no longer the hegemonic superpower, what then? Imagine this really does cause World War III. 
and Russia and China and Iran and all of the countries who hate us rise up and they actually win World War III, you don't think there's going to be war crimes trials just like Nuremberg, but against Americans and the British and the French, all the NATO powers? There will be. So Scahill, you might disagree with him because he's a liberal. He might think, whatever, we're America. We're number one. But he's at least consistent. He's saying, yeah, these people in Russia, they're guilty of war crimes. But so are the U.S. leaders. The corporate media, he continues, has always found it much easier to express outrage at the actions and crimes of a foreign autocrat than to confront the conduct of its own government. And then it goes into his own fundraising pitch. And I wanted to read that because of this whole hypocrisy about, oh, what a surprise, these financial institutions are blacklisting Russian oligarchs. Oh, these Russians, they're guilty of all these war crimes. How could you possibly be surprised by any of this? This has been going on for years to Americans. In fact, I want to go to my Instagram. I've been saving these for the past two weeks. I think they're just gold. I follow things like Bloomberg and Forbes and all this stuff. Business Insider. Business Insider, this was one day ago. This is yesterday. Photos show the luxury mega yachts that belong to Russian oligarchs, some of whom are targeted by sanctions. Next slide is $700 million yacht. And then uh, this has a saloon, a gym, a spa, a library, and an indoor pool. Like these guys are just, what is it with the yachts? They're just all of it. Business Insider, Bloomberg, Forbes, the CNN, everybody is all about the yachts. They're seizing these oligarchs' yachts. Who cares? It's like they're all in lockstep. And it makes you think, all of these financial magazines, all of these banks and financial powers, they have the same exact message as the American government. Like, it's almost like our foreign policy is controlled by the same group that controls the banks and the media. I don't know, that's a crazy conspiracy, like, but it's you know, just something that comes to mind when you see all of these individual outlets using the same language, going after the same spots, talking about yachts. What was the one thing I saw uh, this morning? Or no, it was yesterday morning at the YMCA. They had, um, had CNN on. Genocide! That's what it is. Genocide. Because Russia had uh, allegedly bombed this city, and that every news outlet was talking about genocide. <clears throat> and they are just talking up Zelensky uh, because he is a performer, first of all. Interesting that uh, news anchors would praise him because he is a performer, after all. Actual turn of phrase I heard. He is a performer. Let's not forget that. Like they're praising the guy because he's an act, because he's a clown. He's an actor. They're praising him for this, and they're praising him for, for, uh, invoking Churchill and using phrases from his speeches when he talks to the British House of Lords. It's amazing to watch. But what's more amazing is when you see all of the same phrases being used by different media outlets. Not coordinated at all, right? So as far as the bombing of this city, they all use, um, there were bloodied pregnant women. That's a magic phrase across all of the uh, media outlets. Genocide, of course, but that's a gimme. What was the other one? Um, the daycare thing. It was a really important one. Oh, he gets hungrier with the eating. That's what it was. This is a magic phrase you will notice across several news outlets. That now that Putin has invaded, 
Now is he going to stop? Or has he gotten hungrier with the eating? When you hear that very strange phrase in the English language, <clears throat> it sticks out, right? Sticks out like a sore throat. We don't, we don't use that in daily speech. That's an old saying, sure. But how often do you hear about it in the news? And then as if by magic, different media outlets are talking about the same phrase. Is Putin going to stop now or has he gotten hungrier with the eating? In recent days, continues Scahill, U.S. and NATO officials have highlighted Russia's use of banned weapons, including cluster munitions, and have said that their use constitutes violations of international law. This is indisputably true. What goes virtually unmentioned in much of the reporting on this topic is that the U.S., like both Russia and Ukraine, refuses to sign the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Now, Scahill's talking about that like that's, oh my god, that's horrible. How could they refuse to sign this? Well, we've also refused to sign a lot of other things. We've refused to sign, thank God, the International, Commun uh, International Criminal Court Treaty, right? <clears throat> so all of these different organizations, international law, there's, there's no real government there. Everything is by treaty. It's voluntary. NATO is voluntary. There's no one who, who you know, like, is going to impose NATO on somebody. Right? There's nobody who's going to impose the United Nations. People want to join the United Nations. They'll crawl all over their own mother to join the United Nations so that they have a voice in this community. Same with the Security Council. Nobody's going to leave. You think with all the problems between the U.S. and Russia and China, you think one of these three is going to just walk out of the Security Council? That would be insane. International Criminal Court. You only sign up for that if you want to be held accountable for war crimes under those completely made up statutes, right? We pressure other countries to sign up for this. All these African countries, all these third world countries, we pressure them. Hey, you guys go sign up uh, for the International Criminal Court. That way, when you guys commit genocide, you can be held accountable. Now, to be fair, it might be because they actually do try to commit genocide and we don't. Yeah, okay, but it's still, I mean, just manifestly hypocritical. It is obviously not universalized. And then that gives people like Jeremy Scahill a lot of ammunition. So when he cries about, oh, Russia, Ukraine, the U.S., these people haven't signed the convention on cluster munitions. No, of course they haven't. Because then they would be liable for it in the event that it came down to using them. Duh. A lot of people don't understand that all of these war crimes with which Germany was uh, indicted and all these SS dock, uh, officers were in the dock at the Nuremberg trials, these weren't crimes. These are ex post facto crimes. These are crimes that all of the liberal democratic powers in the lead up to World War One, during World War One, and after World War One, they had all agreed, let's outlaw war. And anybody who wages a war of aggression, well, they're criminals. They had all agreed on this. Germany did not agree to this. That's why they had to be made an example of. So if Russia and Ukraine and the US or whoever doesn't sign the convention on cluster munitions, well, why would they? Get all the African countries to sign on that. Get China to sign up on that. Get all the other countries to sign up on it. That way we don't have to worry about them using it. And if they do, then we can blow that up in the news, no pun intended, and hold them accountable for violating that convention on cluster munitions, but we still have it in our back pocket. That's just plain common sense. Of course we're going to do that. Again, this is real politic. This is, you control a country. You have an obligation to defend that, you know, no matter how you feel about the Biden administration or the American government, they still have a legitimate prerogative in defending this country from uh, outside aggressors, right? It's absolutely in our interest not to sign a convention on cluster munitions if we think that Russia is going to use it against us someday. It's absolutely in our interest to keep our nuclear arsenal if we think that Russia is going to go crazy and start using their nukes. 
it would be suicide to sign this convention while Russia is allowed to use it or to uh, completely destroy our nuclear arsenal if Russia is going to keep theirs. You'd be neutering yourself uh, while the gorilla is looking right at you. <laughs> like, it's just stupid. And to think that we should do it anyway is, uh, is I guess that's just being a leftist. It's, it's idealism, which again, going back to Kaczynski, it's like you think that you have all these morals and ideals. The left has the monopoly on that at this point, right? Anyway, that's your crash course in real politics and the convention on cluster munitions. The U.S. has repeatedly used cluster bombs from the war in Vietnam and the secret bombings of Cambodia to a 2009 attack in Yemen that killed 55 people under President Barack Obama. As I said, <clears throat> at least Jeremy Scahill is consistent, if nothing else. Despite the ban, which was finalized in 2008 and went into effect in 2010, the U.S. continued to sell cluster bombs to nations like Saudi Arabia, which regularly used them in its attacks in Yemen. It is also relevant that to this day there has been no accountability for the crimes committed by the U.S. in its invasion and occupation of Iraq, its 20-year war in Afghanistan, the post-9-11 CIA torture and kidnapping program, or the killing of civilians in drone and other airstrikes in numerous countries. The U.S. has systematized a self-exoneration machine, and Russia and every nation on Earth knows it. There are actions that the U.S. and other Western countries could take to bolster the legitimacy of their denunciations of Putin's actions. They could end support for Israel's aggression against Palestine and recognize Palestinians' legitimate right to self-defense. The U.S. could immediately end all support for Saudi Arabia and make it a pariah, as President Joe Biden promised. The U.S. could stop its drone strikes in Somalia and elsewhere. But that's not what's being talked about on cable news or in the halls of power. And then it goes into his fundraising pitch. Can you argue with any of that? I, it just gives Scahill and The Intercept and other leftists ammunition when you try to take a moral high horse while you're doing exactly the thing that you're denouncing Russia for having done. Carl Schmidt, who I talked about and I'll continue to talk about, brilliant man, one of the greatest legal philosophers of all time, he pointed out that a lot of this stuff about law is really just politics. Not on this program, of course. We would never cross that line. But a lot of this is just plain politics. And we like to, uh, you know, pass that Kool-Aid around and pretend that, well, this is the law. Mr. Putin broke the law. Boston, what's any of this had to do with what he's discussing? All right, I don't know what this is with Mr. Boston, but whatever. Sounds like uh, he's gone for a reason. <laughs> How big was the second largest case? That's a good question, Richard. So I said early in the program that this uh, January 6th Capitol riots thing <clears throat> is the largest prosecution in American history. I'd say the second largest, if I had to guess was probably the Hoover prosecutions of the communists and anarchists uh, because they used to use the FBI against actual bad guys. Uh, I'm going to listen to this later. Playing with my hula hoop. What? That does not sound like something Storm Hunter would say. I think somebody hacked into Storm Hunter's account. Did you see Jussie's attorney's face when he went off? The black guy sitting on his right, he was like, oh no, here we go, I've done my best for this fool. Yeah, so Jesse Smollett was convicted. I cannot believe that. That's crazy. Judges love juries until jury nullification, says Dr. Fraser Crane. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about other places, but you're not allowed to tell the jury, hey, you have the right to nullify this. You know that? I already did, made that appointment. Um, yeah, you're not allowed to tell a jury, hey, if you don't like this, just say not guilty. Just void the whole case. You're not allowed to say that. They're allowed to do that if it occurs to them on their own or if they want to make a stand. But as a defense attorney, I can't tell them that. Because <clears throat> like Dr. Fraser Crane says, they love juries until jury nullification. The message is in is all in or nothing. 
Next time, there will be trials for other parties, uh, says John Gordon Mead. Con law classes forced to attend Constitution Day speech events. Oh, really? That's interesting. Con law is uh, a first-year law school class. Um, for those who don't know, uh, constitutional law is what it's short for. Fully informed jury association, SPQR, the protocols. We take no stance on the protocols. So this is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. Uh, that's what Seamless says. I don't know uh, what movie that is. What movie is that, Seamless? I like to check that out. We are all Russians. Yeah, that's the hence the title of this. We are the Soviets now because now we are cheering on this kid who turned in his own father, and he's not even the worst. I'd say there were. I remember a kid who turned in his own mother, and then bragged about it on Reddit. Like if turning in your own father is low, who turns in their own mother for the love of God? That's it's inhuman. Uh, I mean, it's it's over, guys. It's over. And uh, people are still calling it a republic around here. Experience in international law is valuable today, says Seamus. Yeah, who knew that... Uh, who knew all that training and experience would come into play one day, right? <laughs> um, Semper Fi... All right, I don't know what Mr. Boston is being banned for. These look like okay comments to me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, Mr. Boston, if you want to email me, I will listen to your defense here uh, about why you were banned earlier. I don't know. He says, I have a movie for you. Klaus Schwab bragging about how he owns Canada. Yeah, post that. Um, post that link. I'll check it out. Do you remember the start of the Iraq War? Asks John Gordon Meade. The start of the Iraq War back in 2003, when America bombed an entire apartment block to get Saddam, then they said they missed. Thank you for bringing that up, John Gordon Meade. Because in that same time I was in the YMCA hearing about genocide and bloodied pregnant women and all the other magic phrases they were using, on a different TV with a different news channel, oh my God. They actually, they were saying, this is just like what happened in Iraq. And I was like, oh my God, is somebody actually going to point this out? Like Russia is saying that they're invading the Ukraine because there are uh, biological weapons labs, right? And the U.S. is, of course, saying, no, that's absolutely not true. That's Russian propaganda. That's a lie. There are no bioweapons labs in the Ukraine. This is just pretext for Russia to invade Ukraine. So when I hear the news saying, this is just like what happened in Iraq, I'm thinking, oh my God, is somebody actually going to call out the U.S. for invading Iraq on that pretext? Oh, Saddam is making nuclear weapons? <laughs> no, 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 no. Of course not. This is just like what happened in Iraq. Because Saddam Hussein was just like Putin bullying all his neighbors and Putin this and Saddam that. That's how it's like the Iraq war. Not because we screwed up and kicked in the door and murdered civilians left and right. No, it's because Putin and Saddam Hussein are just buddy-buddy. You know, they're the same guy, basically. Pure evil incarnate. So thank you for bringing that up. We bombed an entire apartment block to get Saddam and then, you know, we missed routinely happens so <clears throat> you might remember the prosecution of well maybe you don't i don't know how many of you are zoomers or millennials or gen xers or what but when timothy mcveigh bombed the oklahoma federal building oklahoma city federal building right he didn't know but there was a daycare in that building what luck right what a bad choice of target for McVeigh and what as a legitimate tragedy he's trying to target federal workers federal government employees right that he sees as the enemy he sees these people as responsible for Ruby Ridge and Waco and it turns out 
There were more kids in that building, from what I recall, than there were ATF agents that day. Absolute tragedy. The news to this day, but especially at that time, the news just reel after reel of the exploded daycare center. How dare this white supremacist, evil, you know, Nazi monster, whatever they call him. He blew up a daycare. He murdered children. And yeah, you will not hear any argument from me. Um, kill, that killing kids is off limits, 100%. But you know, he's sitting there in jail and this comes up and he says, you know, obviously had I known there was a daycare in there, I would not have done this. I, I was not targeting a daycare center. But the amazing hypocrisy of this is the fact that we routinely, when I was a, you know, in the army, we would routinely go over there and take out entire schools or hospitals when we thought there was a bad guy in there. We killed civilians all the time. It was just a casualty of war. Everybody knows that. And by the way, part of the reason that I did this is because they were murdering women and children deliberately, the FBI and ATF, were murdering women and children in Ruby Ridge and in Waco. And that body count far outweighs the Oklahoma City uh, bombing as far as children are concerned. If that never stopped, right? One of the biggest jokes in world history is Obama getting a Nobel Peace Prize when he's deliberately blowing up schools and hospitals to catch bad guys in Afghanistan. And it's like, yeah, I'm not arguing that the Taliban were good guys. Certainly not arguing that these actual terrorists are good people. But, come on. We blow up civilian targets all the time. Routinely. And now we're going to go on CNN and say Putin bombed something near a hospital and there's a bloodied pregnant woman and just say it over and over and over and over and over and over and over until you are outraged that he's deliberately bombing pregnant women and now they're bloody. Right? So thank you, John Gordon Mead, for bringing that up. It's war, man. Bad things happen in war. That's how wars go. That's why we have international law because we know that things happen and what we are trying to prevent at least back in the day when international law was actually legitimate, what we're trying to prevent is excesses in war. We're trying to stop deliberate targeting of civilians like we and the British did at Dresden or elsewhere in Germany in World War II or as happened in Vietnam. Not pointing fingers. I know Vietnam was a hellhole. But we try to prevent excesses try to prevent massacres, try to prevent torture, you know, landmines, bad things, things that kill civilians, things that kill people who have nothing to do with it, evil things like uh, chemical gas attacks, bioweapons, right, things that are just not fair. Now, whether rifles are fair or air support is fair, yeah, you could argue that, but you know, throwing mustard gas at somebody, that's really not fair. That's not gentlemanly. That's not chivalric. That's not legitimate war. And we've been working on these laws of war since the bloody crusades. A long time we've been working on this. Just like I point out all the time, we've been working on these laws of evidence in our American courts. We've been working on the jury system. We've been working on all of these things that we think of when we, constitutional rights. For a thousand years, since William invaded England in 1066, we have been working on this system of law, and now it's all just being thrown out the window. Likewise, since the Crusades, we have been working on these laws of war. And now, now it's a joke. It's just something for people to get upset about on the internet. It's not really useful in modern warfare. We've lost the entire plot. I was actually going through uh, some papers of mine, some old papers, and I found some laugh riots in there. I saw a Wall Street Journal article I'd cut out. 
about how America, this is 2015, like early, like I think March 2015, if I remember correctly, how Americans are ready for a reform president, someone who's going to come in and shake up the system. Hilarious to look back on that article now. After Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Americans were certainly ready for it. But was the system? And could anybody have predicted what the system was going to do? I think so. Because we saw it with Nixon. We saw it with Julius Caesar. Saw it with Napoleon. Which, you know, in retrospect, maybe Napoleon was wrong. But any upstart who's going to challenge the system, everybody's going to gang up on him. They're going to stab him in the back. They're going to take it. Not that Trump was a Caesar, you know, or, or even a Nixon. But you could have seen it coming. Anyway, hilarious to see that. And one of my, the, the biggest, I actually laughed out loud. There was a massive piece in Wall Street Journal with a full color painting of uh, King John surrounded by noblemen and he's being forced to sign the Magna Carta, right? This is 2015 and it said 800 years of liberty. Oh, laugh riot. Could you imagine something like that being published now? Like what if the 800th year of the Magna Carta was this year, right? Was 2022, seven years later. Do you think anybody would have the sand to put out uh, an article full page uh, with a giant picture of of King John being held to account by his noblemen, right? And it said 800 years of liberty. You'd be laughed out of town. Again, I don't think anyone takes the Constitution seriously. I have not heard anybody talk about free speech in forever. <laughs> you know, liberty. Get Are there even... Liber- I, I heard the Libertarian Party still existed. I haven't heard a peep out of them. I guess maybe it's about vaccines. I don't know. But hilarious stuff. Anyway, let's continue on with the uh, with the comments here. We used white phosphorus against people in Afghanistan, but cluster munitions are bad. Yeah, white phosphorus is really bad, man. We use a lot of dirty weapons. Remember um, Iron Man, the Jericho. That was a great movie, by the way. I don't care if it's Avengers. That's like what made it a great movie is like it's a real movie by itself without the ridiculous Avengers stuff going on. <clears throat> Just a standalone good movie. But one of those, like the Jericho. How is that fair? How is that legal under the laws of war? It might as well be a nuke. You know, just blowing everybody up. They stand no chance. White phosphorus, like not Jeffrey Epstein is saying. That's really bad. Might as well throw mustard gas at them. Why not? Or nuke them. Who cares? The U.S. military dropped four 2,000 bombs, 2,000 pound bombs on the building Monday based on time-sensitive intelligence. That was the Saddam Hussein uh, incident. Oh, a terrible Star Wars movie that we were talking about earlier. Star Wars Episode Eleven. Oh, two. Episode two. That's Roman numerals. My bad. Yeah, I don't remember when I saw that. I was a kid when that came out, I reckon. God bless you, Augustus. And back at you. And that reminds me, uh, this thing about the confessions that I was going to do. I think I'm going to do it on St. Patrick's Day. What better day to talk about paganism and Catholicism, right? So we'll do that stream um, Thursday the 17th. And then years later, Powell said he was lied to, and he was really the victim. LOL. Sandra Gates. Uh, It isn't even Russia that is bombing Ukraine. The Ukrainians are going crazy on TikTok saying their own country is bombing them. Yeah, I've heard about that. And uh, Russia has been saying that to everybody, saying we had nothing to do with this quote-unquote genocide. We didn't bomb these people. We had nothing to do with this. Uh, I've got to go to the post office. It's almost five o'clock. We've gone way over time. I have law firm stuff to do. But yeah, Russia's saying that. Ukrainians themselves are saying that. But CNN, don't worry. The Russians are lying. They bombed these people. There's there's bloodied pregnant women 
You monster! How dare you question that? And don't forget the oldie but goodie. One million Iraqi civilian casualties was worth it. By, yeah. Yeah, by Albright. The, uh, she's Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. Yeah. Worth it. That's one of those infamous phrases. Um, for those who don't know the background of that, uh, she was asked about that. Like, look, yeah, maybe we won the war and Saddam is gone, but there are one million civilians in Iraq have been killed because of us. She said it was worth it. Infamous reply. Just like Dick Cheney, right, when he outed the CIA agent, which, you know, Whatever your opinion on that, I don't know. Um, but his infamous retort was, she's fair game, right? Fair game became a <clears throat> an infamous turn of phrase, just like, worth it. One million civilian casualties was worth it to take down Hussam, Saddam Hussein. You know, the Intercept is also going after Biden for war crimes in Afghanistan, we sanctioned the Taliban. We're sanctioning Afghanistan. Like, th that's insane. We abandoned the country. We've been there raising cane for 20 years, by the way. Then we abandon it. We give all of this modern weaponry, uh, countless dollars, you know, over to the Taliban when we just abandon these people, right? No exit strategy whatsoever. And now we're sanctioning them, which is another point about the Russian sanctions that we didn't talk about. Let's talk about the blockade of Germany after World War I. <clears throat> they knew that it was going to kill civilians. Everybody knows that sanctions kill civilians. If you don't know that, like you, I, you're not in government or you've never read a history book, I don't know. But I guarantee you, the people in the Biden administration people in the U.S. military, the people in the banks and international finance, they know full well that sanctioning Russia or sanctioning Afghanistan or the Taliban or whoever, it will kill civilians. That's like, you know, saying we're going to shoot into a crowd, but, uh, you know, it's, it's bound to hit a bad guy somewhere. You are going to kill civilians in that crowd. With sanctions, you will kill civilians. It is not a question of whether, it's a question of how many will die. If you sanction Russian, if you sanction Russia, you destroy their entire economy, all the while going on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News saying, uh, well, this isn't a war between our peoples. This is the madman Putin. He's the one that's got to pay, so we're going to sanction him personally. These sanctions are not about the Russian people. That is a bald-faced lie. Everybody knows the Russian people are the ones who are going to pay, for, not to mention the cost we're paying. But we sanctioned Russia. We know that Russians are going to die. Everybody knows it. Everybody in the government behind this knows it. Everybody in international finance knows it. Everybody knows. Putin knows it. Biden knows it. It's a fact of life. You sanction a country. You blockade them like we did with Germany. You are deliberately targeting civilians to break their morale so they will not support their government. I've uh, mentioned this book on this program quite often, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War by Pat Buchanan. You should read that book. The, these things, they go on and on and on. That book is not just about World War II. It's about every war where we have these made-up laws or these made-up moral justifications for going to war. <clears throat> it's about every war where we have sanctions or other measures that are deliberately targeting civilians so we will break their morale so they won't support the government and their war effort will collapse. It's about every war. So I highly recommend Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary uh, War by Pat Buchanan. I really got to go to the post office so we are going to have, I was deployed, Coach Alpha Elite, I was deployed Afghanistan, uh, OEF-14, we were all lied to, I was a combat medic on FOB Shindan. Well, I think I speak for us all when I say thank you for your service, and I'm sorry that you were lied to. That's how it goes. Ever seen that 
very liberal Oliver Stone movie, Born on the Fourth of July. Like, how do you argue with that? You know, <clears throat> Tom Cruise comes back. He's disabled. His legs don't work. He's trying to get a job. And the guy who owns the the burger restaurant he's trying to work at, he's like, look what you did, man. You know, you went and you sacrificed for this country. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about you. Nobody cares about what you sacrificed. Nobody cares what you did. And it's a brutal truth that Tom Cruise's character comes to realize. And then, you know, he joins the Democrats and the hippies or whatever, the, the war protesters, right? Um, and that was back when the left, like, actually cared about things that mattered, you know, like Rage Against the Machine, like, I will do what you tell me and all that. That was that era of the left. Far gone now. And now we hypocritically talk out one side of our mouth saying, God bless our soldiers. We're behind our soldiers 100%. Veterans' rights, veterans' support, veterans' everything. You know, while simultaneously, but they should all be charged with war crimes. But also those other guys should be charged with war crimes because they're the real villains. But we're also the real villains. And it's schizophrenic. How long can this last? Sandra says, and the ones that are real bling, oh, really blind, are the ones that Trump uh, that think that Trump actually cares for America. Take it from a Trump voter, you guys, you have no idea what you are supporting. Um, well, I can't comment on uh, politics, but I will say legally... Let's go back to that article. Ulfric is asking whether there are any updates on the abortion proceedings in Texas. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't have any because I'm just focused on January 6th and the Russian invasion today. There are so many other things I want to talk about, like the FBI entrapment. Oh, that's a good article from The Intercept that I'll tell you. You should look up on your own because I can't read this whole thing here. But I do want to read this particular paragraph. There's an article about FBI terrorism and the Gretchen Whitmer trial in The Intercept, and it's making the point that it's very troublesome when there are so many FBI informants who are involved in this Capitol riot, right? You try to manufacture this whole thing about white supremacist revolution and all the rest, and then it turns out, actually, there's a high number of uh, of federal agents in there who are behind this that's problematic the intercept of all people is reporting on that meanwhile fact checkers hold on is that this tab here fact checkers uh have thank god verified there is no credible evidence that the federal government was involved in planning the january 6 2021 insurrection fact checkers report that was the Twitter moment, U.S. National News, on March 9th, <clears throat> just two days ago. Thank God the fact checkers are on the case. But The Intercept is also reporting. Contrary to what Twitter would have you believe, The Intercept is also reporting that there were, in fact, feds inside of this group pushing this to happen. And they make the comparison with the Whitmer kidnapping plot in Michigan which the FBI itself said this is this case is a disaster. It was the FBI who was half the group. The FBI set it up. The FBI pushed it. And now it's coming out that the FBI was behind January 6th. Maybe not behind, but deeply involved and certainly instigating it. But I want to point out this paragraph. I can't read the whole article, so I'm going to post it down there when I'm done in the comments. But I want to read this particular paragraph. Jury selection in the federal trial of the Wolverine Watchmen began this week. Now, that's the plot where they say that these, you know, militia guys, they were kidnapping the governor. Uh, and then it turns out it was actually the FBI instigating the whole thing. So that federal trial began this week. <clears throat> Defense lawyers have signaled that they will argue that their clients were entrapped. And while entrapment defenses have rarely succeeded in international terrorism sting cases the justice department appears concerned that's a lot to unpack for the uninitiate entrapment is where you can prove that the government basically set you up 
you had no predisposition to commit an act of terrorism or kidnapping or whatever it was, and these people pushed you to do it. The feds entrapped you. Now, what they're talking about, international terrorism sting cases, they actually talk about this throughout the article. And I would highly recommend, no matter your political views, that you watch Imperium, which is a movie that Harry Potter, excuse me, uh, Daniel Radcliffe did, uh, where he is an FBI agent who infiltrates a white supremacist group. That's basically the plot. Uh, it's like an updated American History X. Anyway, it shows in the very beginning, he's working for the FBI, and he's displeased because the government set this kid up. I, I don't remember. It's been a long time since I've seen him. I think he was a Somali immigrant. So he figures out uh, Harry Potter, that is, he figures out that actually this guy would never have done this if it weren't for the FBI pushing him to do it. And so they take him off that case and they put him in the white supremacist case. And you can imagine how that goes, right? So that's what they're talking about. International terrorism sting cases where defense lawyers argue, actually, the government pushed these guys to do this. That rarely works out. But in this case, with the Michigan case, this Michigan kidnapping plot, the Justice Department appears concerned. Prosecutors cut a plea deal on the eve of the trial with one defendant, Caleb Franks, in exchange for his testimony that he was not entrapped by government agents. Wild. Wild. If that is not ultra concerning to you, I don't know what to say to you, man. The Fed's actually made a deal with this guy saying you testify for us that you were not entrapped by government agents and we'll cut a deal with you you won't go to trial you just testify for us saying you were not set up you were not entrapped and we'll uh do whatever plea deal it is does it matter what plea deal it is i mean is he looking at 30 years in prison or i think kidnapping is uh as a life it was a plot to kidnap, though. They didn't actually do it. So I don't know what he was looking at, but let's just say he's looking at 30 years in prison. Anything short of that is going to be a deal, right? They say, look, we'll enter a plea deal on the federal sentencing guidelines. You're looking at, you know, 10 to 15 years. That's still a deal for Caleb Franks. And all you've got to do is come in and say that we didn't entrap you. Sound good? So let me post this in the comments because I'd like you to read this in your off time before next week's program. All right. There we go. Uh, you can always do another episode tomorrow. Go to the post office. I know, man, but no, I can't. I got, I got way more things to do tomorrow. Uh, democracy is dying, Augustus. Hope you are still running for Congress. It's up to you to save democracy. Yeah. <laughs> LOL. I love Big Brother now. I would never run against Big Brother. Yep, yep, got to get to the post office. All right, well, everybody's on the same page here. Pavlik Morosov is a hero. So is, what's his face, Refit, Jackson Refit. Thank God we have patriotic young men who will turn in their own fathers, turn in their own mothers to the FBI and then brag about it on Reddit. This is the new Soviet Union. And I am gladly your host for this program, Crime and Punishment. God, I love this country. I love Big Brother. And you know, you should too. Now, I've got to get to the post office, our federal government, our favorite department. I don't know. There's so many favorites in the federal government. But I've got to get to one of them to mail this off to a client who is unfortunately incarcerated. So... I hope you all come to love Big Brother. I hope you love this country as much as I do. We will see you next Friday. Till then.